So I'm going on eBay and I'm uh, typing in organs or organ, musical instruments, and there are 15,805. Untold numbers of organs come up. Stuff from the 70s, there's serious machines on there. A Technics U90 electronic organ. Phenomenal piece of kit. It's got a buy it now for 99 pence. An amazing looking machine. I couldn't give it away. I advertised it, I think, for £25. No takers. They're actually saying no payment required. They don't even want the 99p off you. I've seen them thrown on the tip. Advertise it free, no takers. Often you'll see, you know, my father passed away, but he left this behind, and I'll email the seller and I'll say, um, does it have this feature? And they just don't know what you're talking about. It's just, it turns on and it plays, and that's enough for them. I was offered a top-of-the-range Hammond, and I hummed and hard about it and measured it, and by the time I thought, yeah, I can get it in, too late, mate, I've dumped it. And that was an organ which was maybe £15,000 new. As a designer, sometimes I look to the past in order to move forward. I try to find good things which have, for some reason, been abandoned, and then see if there's a way to reinvigorate an idea, make it relevant to today's life. eBay can be a great starting point for research. It's cultural and social archaeology, where artefacts from bygone lives turn up. And this world of the home organ intrigues me. Why are so many old organs for sale? and so many makes and varieties, and who owned them? We generally say that the heyday of the organ was from 1970 in the UK up to 85. Uh, it was around before then, but 70 was when it really started to take off. My name's Andrew Gilbert. I've been an organist now for 43 years, and I had the pleasure of working right through the heyday of the electronic organ industry. The official title was Chief Demonstrator, but now they call it Product Specialist. When I was about eight or nine, my dad took me to the Ideal Homes exhibition, I think it was, and there was a Hammond organ being played. Now, up to then, I'd only ever heard organs in church because I was in the church choir, and I couldn't believe the sound that came out of this thing, you know, massive great big sound. To start the instrument, you have to get these discs up to speed, so... James Taylor formed his quartet in 1987 and was part of the acid jazz movement. They're spinning up. He played a big part in the resurgence of interest in the Hammond sound in the 1990s. And then you have to click it into gear. And then once it's running at the correct speed, you can let go of the starter motor. And then... It's out of tune, but it settles down and becomes in tune. And it was built to emulate the church pipe organ. And when they first released the Hammond, they did a load of tests with pipe organ specialists, blindfolded, and it passed with flying colours. They couldn't tell the difference between... Because it actually, you know, it, it does have a kind of... <laughs> to all intents and purposes, at that time in the 1940s, like early, late 30s, it was doing what a pipe organ in America could do, except this was something that they could buy and, and put in a kind of gospel church or Pentecostal church. The instrument was built for kind of white, middle-class, squeaky clean, 1940s American society, white American society. Jimmy Smith got hold of it and subverted it and made it something far more menacing and dangerous. And that's what made the instrument exciting for me, really. You take the very thing which is at the essence of the all-powerful community, you know, and flip it on its head and make it cool. Jimmy Smith is the start of the organ's great journey into the rock and pop limelight, and that's a huge other story. But right now, I'm interested in its secret life in private. Hammond, he wasn't a musician, he was a businessman, and so he looked at what people were really playing at home for the few organs that actually got sold into homes. And he said, well, look, they don't use the top octave of the pedals and they don't use the bottom half of this keyboard here, so I'll get rid of that. And I'll put in just half the stuff that I normally put in my bigger organs, but crucially, I'll make it make the same sound. And he invented the spinet organ. And within a year or two, that had outsold every organ that he'd produced since Hammond started. The big American companies all followed suit Wurlitzer, Thomas, Lowry, making these small organs. 
only a few buttons and stops on them, and quite primitive in the sounds, but it got them into the home. Rory Moore plays a 1960s Lowry. He's based at what was once another popular home for the organ, the Working Man's Club. This one is in Bethnal Green. Thank you very much. In front of me here, it's a 1962 Lowry Heritage Deluxe organ. It was definitely aimed at a white, middle-class American audience. If you just wanted, say, the popular organ sound of the time, so you had that kind of standard sort of a sound. <laughs> But then, for the aspiring home organist, uh, you have, like, a clarinet stop. Which you can add a bit of sustain to, and a bit of vibrato. And you can add a bit of glide. And that's your Lowry Hawaiian guitar sound. You know, and it's a 1962 living room. You know, that's kind of sound fabulous. You know, that's, that's a whole new sound, and... Hammond weren't capable of creating these sort of sounds, but Lowry had the technology, making exotic sounds become alive in your living room. I love this idea of turning the living room into an exotic world. It's an aesthetic I grew up with in a family home, with my nan's gathering of exotica from her trips to Madeira in the 1960s. Just sorting through to find this one. Another part of the organ world in healthy supply on eBay is old brochures and advertisements. In fact, these tend to sell for more than the organs themselves. I'm looking here at an advert for a, a Con 646. I've never heard of a Con 646, but it's a large-scale home organ. Lots of wood in it. Um, would look glorious in a decent-sized uh, 70s-style living room. The wife is there. She's got dressed up to play the organ, as you would. She's put a, a nice pair of kitten heels on. Her hair has been done how a woman's hair should be done when you're at home, you know, she's had it styled. Her husband is really enjoying his wife playing the organ, and he's dancing in the most happy way. It's like John Travolta meets your dad. The electric organ was a big step in musical technology, so it's easy to see why so many of these machines ended up in people's living rooms, you know, and replaced the piano. To get a decent, upright piano in 72, you'd pay about £700, an organ, 250 There was a lot of competition between the makes. You had Hammond, Lowry, Conn, Thomas, Garbranson, Baldwin, Farfisa, Elka, Orla. Originally, electric organs were designed to go into the church, so organs just retained that kind of heavy wood look. Many of the time that we've delivered an organ and we've had to take the doors off. Sometimes they've gone in via the windows. They were solid wood cases, a lot of them, you know, and they did make beautiful pieces of furniture, sometimes the focal point of people's lounge, weren't they, you know? Hello, I'm Nigel Ogden. I'm the presenter of The Organist Entertains on BBC Radio 2, which I'm very proud to have been since March 1980. The Organist Entertains began as a weekly programme in June 1969, and uh, 45 years later, here we are. A lot of people were buying electronic instruments for their own entertainment at home, and so the appearance of The Organist Entertains on the airwaves really slotted in very nicely. Greetings, everyone. Robin Richmond here, and I expect you're all... Robin Richmond was its presenter for the first ten years, and he used to incorporate uh, at least two tracks on electronic organs uh, per week. As you know, I've always tried to unite the various tastes and factions which exist in the organ world, so it gave me great pleasure to see how Brian Sharp, our young electronics genius, was applauded by the classical fraternity. So here's one then for the tax man, written by George Gershwin called They Can't Take That Away From Me. <laughs> We always used to promote the idea that it was easy to play, and indeed they were. But if you wanted to really learn to play properly, then you had to work quite hard at it. Most organ shops would have their own organ schools, 
and they would teach lots of people in a language lab sort of situation. They'd have maybe half a dozen or a dozen organs all linked together to a central console, and it got people playing. The various organ companies would put on these showcases and invite people along to big halls in various towns and cities, and there would be the full range of instruments by any one manufacturer and a top of the name player playing them. And they think, goodness me, to have that at home and to be able to produce those sounds would be absolutely fantastic. They were always followed up by what we called the in-store parties, wine and cheese evenings, and this was the hard sell. We'd get them sitting down at the organs and they would sell and sell and sell. Huge, huge numbers. In many cases, I think it was a void of discovery because people would get these things home, sit down, and in some cases, some people found they couldn't do anything with it at all, but other people found they'd really got a gift for it. And, of course, this was exactly what the manufacturers wanted because they'd then go down to the local organ dealer and part X that and get a bigger model, and so it went on and so it went on. The word cheesy is often used to describe the sound of the electronic organ. It's music for loungers and ends of peers. But the organ's significant position in jazz, rhythm and blues, soul, funk, rock, gospel, even reggae, contradicts this. I find this tension between kitsch and cool really fascinating. Can we define what we mean by cheesy in sonic terms? Where do cool and kitsch meet and divert? The setting which became famous in the jazz world was the C3 setting, which is the kind of... which has a kind of wobble on it. If I turn the wobble off, it becomes more like a pipe organ. The problem is, that C3 vibrato setting, for me, sounds cool as anything, but some of the other choices that you had... You see, that's home organ, and that vibrato is big. That's a big wobble. that sale of the century world. Other artefacts of the organ heyday, with plenty of examples on eBay, are organ vinyl records. Visually, they range from kitsch to cool to nonsensical, and many are collector's pieces in their own right. There's a wonderful uh, cover just sorting through to find this one. Brian Sharp playing the exotic sound of the electronic organ. And the word exotic is written in some kind of faux Hawaiian font, and out of the back of exotic is a palm tree. The next stage down, it says the sound of electronic, and that is written in proper 1969 Apollo going to the moon font, so evocative of the late 60s and of the space race. You look at Klaus Wunderlich and Pop Party Volume 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. A group of people who've come round to Klaus's house, they've all put on their glad rags. They've all got a glass in their hand. They're all bopping away to 1 minute 31 of Rasputin, which then seeks seamlessly into summer nights. You know, the home organ is a catalyst for good times. With an organist like Klaus Wunderlich, there's a certain strategy which appeals to people, or a certain way of doing things. What sounds does he use? You know, how, many, how many buttons is he going to press? And is he going to suddenly switch over to the oboe? I don't know much about his music, but people would shout that at me as an insult. That was a bit of heckling, was to call me Klaus Wunderlich. <laughs> He is a bit of an acquired taste, but have you heard his version of Summertime? You hear a track like Summertime and you realise the potential of an electric organ. Project Mustang was launched in 1970 as the Hammond Piper Autochord, and it was the first ever instrument that had easy play facilities, where you could hold down a chord, select a rhythm, and it would play you an accompaniment. Now, I can do something a little bit like that. (laughs) 
instantly it was a massive massive hit everybody jumped on the bandwagon and then you had one finger chords you could play one note and play a chord with your left hand and then suddenly the whole tune would just harmonize around what you're playing it's, it's crazy i mean it makes you sound like you know what you're doing did that take over from the organist well yes it did and you had to be careful that you still actually stayed in control of it. You know, as the great organist John Patton said, you must play it, it must not play you. <sighs> do I think the organ is playing me? Yes, I do. If I've got a driving rhythm, uh, for example... <sighs> like that, you know, it's... When I go shopping in the north, I find the service is always splendid. You know, I can barely keep up with it. I mean, it's got a mind of its own, you know, it just, um, it will, it'll just play without me. It doesn't need me, but I need it. Well, my name is John Shuttleworth. I'm a versatile singer organist. It's a Yamaha PSS 51. I bought this keyboard off a policeman who was very angry with Yamaha because, it, you see, he thought he'd be able to play it really easily because it says single finger play, but you've still got to know which finger to put down. To me, it's much more superior to... Um, than these organs that you get in the church. They don't have a proper built-in rhythm. I've got that, you see. You know. Oh. Yeah. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Nigel Ogden. Man, he doesn't, is it Ogden's Flake? I'm Graham Fellows. I'm the creator of John Shuttleworth, and I like organs, perhaps almost as much as John. I was at a, an ex-girlfriend's house, and her father was demonstrating this new keyboard that he'd bought Ooh. and he couldn't quite play it. Ooh. And uh, the fact that it was just slightly out of control. Yeah, it's gone again. It was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. He, he, he said, listen to this, and he'd, and he'd play this sort of beat that would be you know, a samba beat as programmed by a musician in Tokyo. He was clearly excited by the sound that he'd produced but was keeping his emotions in check. The lovely thing about having your own organ is that if you're miserable, you can cheer yourself up by playing... A jaunty rhythm. Oh, Mary had a little lamb, green beans and new potatoes. I had tuna and sweet corn flan. We served ourselves, no waiters. It was a carvery. When I started uh, with the keyboard, yes, the whole family were gathered round. Mary, my son Darren, my daughter Karen, the Scotty dog Kirsty. I've met families where the entire family played. The children played, parents played, and the grandparents came over and played. Making music at home was just part of life, and a very good part of life. I think that home organ world was what that was about. It became a centre of entertainment, a good alternative to the television. Of course, you've got to remember, in those days, it was only three channels, and nobody watched BBC Two, so it was only two, wasn't it? There was nothing to do but look out of the window, and then you couldn't see out because of the net curtains. That's why the organ became the centrepiece. At your fingertips, on those home organs, you could create a beautiful little groove. You had a little band going straight. I mean, I can see the attraction of it. I wish that I could play an organ and could get people around and do this. Um, I think a few years ago, I would have been thinking about that from a kitsch point of view. Now, as a 53-year-old, I think, hmm, there's something in this. In the hall of the mountain king. Organ clubs were massive in the heyday. Every town had at least a couple of organ clubs, sometimes even more. But there are still clubs here that get a couple of hundred people in there to hear people playing an organ. And people go there for the first time, not knowing quite what to expect. And they are still blown away with the idea that one person is sitting at the console of an instrument and is making all of these different sounds. A big hand to Mr Brett Wales. Brett Wales was brought up in Nottingham by his grandparents in a home with an organ. He is a true example of the organist as the one-man band, a self-sufficient entertainer. What he does is extreme coordination, and he's amazing to watch. I was born in 1978. I've been playing the organ since the age of three. I more or less like left college and walked into doing the organ clubs, playing on the organ circuit. It's kind of the unmentionable sort of, <laughs> don't talk about the organ circuit. When you're ready, the hatchway at the back is now open. Teas, coffees, etc. 
There's a big screen next to me with a camera and a projector showing people what I do. If I was to play like something really fast and furious, people would like go, how's he doing it? If they've got something to look at, it's always better. I suppose the skill is to do with how much thought you've put into creating that complicated arrangement and your choice of sounds and, oh, he's an accordion sound there. Maybe a tuba would have sounded better there. I don't sound like an organ when I play. If I'm playing something orchestral like the Blue Danube, it sounds just like an orchestra, you know. But that's the whole idea. Originally, the cinema organ was trying to sound like an orchestra. So I'm sat in front of the Versi Louvre. It's a big white machine. These now retail at £37,000. The impact that it has on stage is just amazing. People tend to think you can play better, you know? I've got mass amount of buttons on it, 15-inch screen. So if I touch a saxophone button... A rock sax. Got an accompaniment section where my drummer sits. If I hear anybody else make an innuendo when I mention the words organ, ooh, organ, ooh. It's a large upright model and it's far better off if you don't play alone and everyone joins in. Hey, it's not that kind of show, is it? There's nothing it can't do, so what about we do some Queen? Shall we do some Queen? It's a kind of magic. It's a kind of magic. For me, it's always been about entertaining people. It's not about showing people how clever you are, it's about making a good sound and promoting the organ. With the latest digital instruments, the sounds are just so authentic. You can have any sound that you like, the sky's the limit. They're basically giant synthesizers contained in a kind of organ shell, and they can do everything. I mean, they're just amazing. I mean, an accordion does sound like an accordion. String section, rather on, see on this Larry, it says string. Well, that's not a string, clearly. You asked if I got a Hawaiian guitar. Yes, I have. Number 41. Alpenhorn. I started listening to more expensive more up-to-date keyboards, the sounds were, were just a bit too real. The, the humour had gone. What's funny about a clarinet uh, not sounding uh, right? Oh, no, that's lovely, that. Yeah. Yeah, I got egg 